Diversity and inclusion is at the heart of our brand promise and always has been. It's in our DNA. Real progress on diversity and inclusion doesn't happen without real work. This work belongs to all of us, and I look forward to partnering with you so everyone feels included at Amazon. Do we simply want to be included in a fundamentally broken and unjust system, or do we want to return to the roots of what people were fighting for at Stonewall and work to dismantle that system? Under the guise of caring for the marginalized and downtrodden, more and more corporations are signaling their virtue by making statements about social justice. And some are even attempting to use their power and influence to make political changes for the rest of society. Certain CEOs do seem quite committed to the causes they push for, like Mark Benioff of Salesforce who said, when government is unable or unwilling to act, business should not wait. So clearly some business leaders are attempting to meddle in social and political affairs using economic force, occasionally while railing against the free market system that has brought them so much success in the first place. We have to wonder if they're really that concerned with social justice, if they're leveraging woke politics for financial gain, or if they're just flaunting their moral stature. And when did all this start? How did we get to a place where corporations decided to mix woke politics with business? Part of this traces back to the 2008 financial crisis, which began and created this new apologist model of capitalism. And, and I recognize and remember this pretty well because I got my first job in New York City after graduating from college in the fall of 2007, on the eve of the 08 crisis. What happened in the 08 crisis was actually pretty meaningful, I think, for the history of capitalism in this country, for the history of social movements in this country, in ways that we still are you know, struggling to wrap our heads around a decade and a half later. What happened was that big business, Wall Street in particular, banks in particular, paid their employees and their CEOs a lot of money when times were good, but then when times went bad, the public ended up bailing them out. And I think that created an existential crisis, literally an existential crisis for the heart and soul of American capitalism, where Occupy Wall Street was on Wall Street's doorstep. They demanded that something different be done. The Occupy Wall Street vision was to take money from those wealthy corporate fat cats and redistribute it to poor people to help poor people, okay? Agree or not, that's what the old left had to say. But right around that time, capitalist elites in this country recognized that there was also the birth of this new movement on the left, not quite the Occupy Wall Street left, not quite the redistributionist, economically focused left, but a new racially obsessed wing of the left, a new gender identity obsessed wing of the left, a new LGBTQ plus obsessed wing of the left, the woke left, that said that the real problem wasn't quite economic injustice or poverty, it was this racial injustice and misogyny and bigotry. And that actually presented an opportunity of a generation, but a complicated choice for Wall Street and big business to make in this country, where they thought that Occupy Wall Street was a pretty tough pill to swallow, but this new woke stuff might actually be a little bit easier. Applaud diversity and inclusion. Put some token minorities on your boards. Muse about the racially disparate impact of climate change after you fly in a private jet to a fancy ski town. This is pretty good work, actually, if you could get it. And so they made a shift in their strategy to recognize that the public demanded something new of American capitalism. The old model of greed is good wasn't going to be good enough. They needed to come up with something else instead. That's when the ESG movement really was born. That's when stakeholder capitalism was really born or caught on fire. And then what we saw was this new merger between Wall Street and big business and eventually Silicon Valley and much of the rest of corporate America with this new woke left they didn't really love each other. I'm not saying that they fell in love. This was, this was an arranged marriage. It was not a marriage of love. It was closer to mutual prostitution, actually. But what they did was they gave birth to this new woke capitalist movement that wasn't quite the action of big government, but nor was it the action of classical markets and private enterprise. It was a new hybrid of both that together created this new monster that was far more powerful than either one of those forces alone. And I think that's the origin story that we're still continuing to pay the price of today. I think it is the cultural cost of the 2008 financial crisis that continues to reverberate through our economy and our economic system today. Because we want to address systemic racism in society head on and accelerate change, 
Walmart and the Walmart Foundation are committing $100 million to create a new center on racial equity. While we've been having discussions for a decade about diversity and inclusion and, and making sure that we're doing our role, not only with our employees, but our communities, and making sure in many cases, particularly somebody like me as a white male, that we're doing more listening. To move forward in a more sustainable, decarbonized world, it requires a combination of government and private sector. I called Governor DeSantis this morning to express our disappointment and concern that if legislation becomes law, it could be used to unfairly target gay, lesbian, non-binary, and transgender kids and families. Do either of you regret for one minute firing him? It is important for the women at Google and for all the people at Google we want to create an inclusive environment. In the context of a workplace, it was the right decision for us to make. It's hard for me to believe that so many of these CEOs actually buy that ideology. It's so obviously nihilistic. It so rejects reality on so many levels. I can't help but think that because it's gotten purchased in the culture and with a loud portion of the culture, that they're just afraid and they're reacting more from fear than actual commitment. So I think the more people who come out in support of a proper orientation towards reality and start rejecting this stuff outright, the more they're gonna come around, because in the end, it's the bottom line for them. If people aren't buying their product because of the things that they believe, then they're gonna to have to make adjustments, I think, with respect to the things that they believe. They pretend it like they care about something other than profit and power, precisely to gain more profit and power. That is the defining magic trick of 21st century capitalism, okay? That is State Street standing up a new statue of fearless girl, standing up to the bull on Wall Street, pretending to stand for feminism, all the while doing it when they're facing a lawsuit from their own female employees, saying they don't pay their own female employees well enough. This is the game of the woke capitalist, the inauthentic version. This is mostly what you see on Wall Street and in the investment management industry. I think that's a majority of what's going on. I think there is a minority of people who actually authentically believe the values that they're pushing. And you could make an argument that that's even more dangerous than the inauthentic kind because it is an abuse of market power to settle political questions through the use of economic force. And to me, one of the most important hallmarks of living in a democracy is making sure that it is a country that settles its most important political questions and political disagreements through free speech and open debate rather than through the use of force. And what this new ESG-infused stakeholder capitalist movement is effectively doing is it is using force rather than political mechanisms, rather than free speech and open debate, to settle the very questions that we might otherwise disagree about as citizens. ESG is a social credit system that scores companies according to whether or not they're abiding by the new vision for American capitalism. So it's the scoring system for stakeholder capitalism. Think about it as a social credit system. It stands for environmental, social, and governance factors. And it refers to a new template that companies have to use in addition to the old templates they used to use to decide how they allocate capital in their businesses, how they build their businesses, how they hire people, how they invest in new projects, how they invest in other companies to say that it no longer is just the long-run profitability of those projects that matters, but that it is also an added matrix of environmental, social, and governance factors that need to be taken into account. That's a fancy way of saying actually certain progressive political agendas, how do we weave that into our allocation of capital itself? Not necessarily through government, but through the private sector itself. Though it is related to government, I think there's lurking state action behind the scene, but it's behind the scene, at least through the front door, they say it's business leaders making these decisions voluntarily on their own. ESG is now not just a challenge to the old orthodoxy, it is the new orthodoxy. It is the way of modern American business. It is the way of corporate America. It is the way of capital markets in America. The leading contenders, standard bearers for the ESG movement include firms like BlackRock, manages over $10 trillion, together with number two and number three, State Street and Vanguard, the th big three manage collectively over $20 trillion, all of them pledging fealty to this new ESG movement. And so what we've seen is these titans of private industry, the capital allocators in private industry, deciding that they're going to actually demand the infusion of a political agenda into the way that businesses are run by using their status as shareholders in these companies to implement those agendas through the back door. 
Many of these investment firms encourage the corporations they're involved with to focus on climate change, social justice, and innocuous sounding terms like diversity, equity, and inclusion, and more. As a result of this and social pressures by some consumers and online culture, CEOs often feel a need to address societal problems without actually paying attention to the results of their efforts or considering whether they should really be the ones addressing these problems to begin with. This happens not only in big corporations, but the underlying woke ideology fueling this new vision of society and free markets also affects local businesses, schools, and even the government. The end goals seem innocent and morally necessary. The claim is that we all need to do our part to reduce sexism, racism, and other forms of discrimination in society. That sounds good on the surface, but once you dig deeper and understand the ideology behind this vision, you see a contempt for our present system and the liberty that has allowed us to flourish and achieve real progress. This is especially present in the anti-racist movement that has created diversity, equity, and inclusion consultants and departments all over corporate America and in our school system. We would do well to ask if these anti-racists really have pure motives, and we ought to also pay close attention to their stated goals. The phenomena of, quote, anti-racism has become a multi-million dollar machine for making money. Facebook, Twitter, all of these people are pumping millions of dollars of grants into so-called nonprofits that are earning their presidents, you know, six-figure salaries a couple times over. My training as a journalist was at the Wall Street Journal, so I've always followed the money. And I've now been filing Freedom of Information Act requests with school districts, getting the contracts on these diversity, equity, and inclusion consultants. And they're making $270,000 for just one year in one school district in Austin, Texas. They're making $15,000 for one hour in Naperville, Illinois. They're buying in Fairfax County, Virginia, $24,000 of Ibram Kendi's books to give away to the students. So one danger is this misspending of taxpayer dollars by government agencies. But the second fatal flaw in all of this for our society that must make everyone wake up to this problem is the fact that they are putting poisonous ideas into the beautiful minds and hearts and souls of our children. Like our children should grow up with the identity of humanity, not the identity of these superficial items that we are born into. But what they have done is they have divided people, they have used this ridiculous term of affinity groups in order to bring segregation back into our classrooms and into our workplaces. They have taken concepts that we rejected decades ago of separation and imposed them on us as if they were liberating ideas. They are just making a joke out of what it means to work and study in this world today. They want equal outcomes for people and ultimately their idea is that if you have any kind of difference in outcomes, it's because of systemic racism. Is the right way to fight racism through implementing racial quota systems as the anti-racist movement demands? Or is it some other way? And I'm not putting words in anyone's mouth here. I'm gonna quote you Ibram Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. The remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. The remedy to present discrimination is future discrimination. So not for me, but from the proponents of this movement, that's what anti-racism stands for in this country. You can agree with it or you can disagree with it. You can agree with him, Ibram Kendi, or you could agree with John Roberts, the Supreme Court Justice who said, the best way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. I fall in the John Roberts school. Other people may fall in the Abram Kendi school, but there are legitimate disagreements about whether the anti-racist movement is solving racism in the United States or whether it is causing racism in the United States. I happen to think it is causing racism in the United States. I think you could say the same about many of the other, I believe, self-defeating solutions proposed by this neo-progressive left that may be well-intentioned in the problems they want to solve, but may implement solutions that actually make those very underlying problems worse as I think the anti-racism movement is doing to underlying racism in the United States. However, that is a separate substantive debate 
that is different from a, another question. It is whether no matter what your views are on this, on the underlying substantive question of how to fight racism, the question of whether we should want corporations in this country to be responsible for settling that question. And I think that whether you're on the right or the left, whether you're woke or whether you're arch conservative, you ultimately ought to agree as an American, as a citizen of our country, that we want to settle these questions through healthy, open, authentic disagreement and debate in the public square as citizens, rather than through economic force where Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock and a couple of his cronies get to sit in a back corner office and decide what vision of society is right for the rest of us. And if you don't like the woke vision they advocate today, note that they might actually push an alternative vision tomorrow. But the point is once you turn corporations into vectors for advancing a progressive ideology, they can be vectors for advancing any ideology. And this is a place where I think liberals and conservatives ought to come together to reject the use of corporate force to settle these questions that we'd rather disagree with one another in the open as citizens, even if that means that one side might win sometimes and the other side might win the other times. That's still a better and more functioning democratic and Republican society than one in which it's actually a small group of corporate emperors that make those decisions behind closed doors. Those pushing for a woke corporate agenda often have little regard for the people who disagree with them. They're unrestrained in how they push their ideal vision of society onto the rest of us. And that's largely because they believe they've arrived at some ultimate truth about the best way to organize society and how to do the most good. While some of these activists are driven by a genuine desire to alleviate suffering, others are driven more by the desire to undermine our liberal, democratic system while making as much money as they can in the process. Much of what has generated the latter motivation has been higher education, which has been putting forth far left propaganda for decades. I really feel like there's a massive group of people who have been educated into thinking that Western civilization, qua Western civilization is evil and needs to be dispensed with. They see absolutely nothing positive about it at all. They conflate Western civilization with the most evil aspects of human history. They believe that everything we think, everything that we know to be true, everything that we think is good or bad, is sort of a social construct. It doesn't come from observation of reality. It comes from what people at the top of the power hierarchy are telling us is true, good, or bad. And they're telling us that, and we believe it, because they want to maintain that position of power. And so the idea is to undo it all, to erase it all, to, throw it, to toss it all in the ocean and create a different hierarchy based on identities that come from your emotions, from what you feel, or from a metric of victimhood. So now it's, it's not the people who achieve or make money or who are at the top of the capitalist food chain that are worth admiring. It's the people who have been abused and oppressed by the system that now have moral stature and they deserve stuff because of the fact that they've been at the intersection of all of these types of abuses and oppressions. And so they deserve special privileges that the government has to bestow on them. I can only imagine that these are folks that see a great opportunity to advance their own professional and personal lives. There are many people who want to say, oh, these are well-intentioned people. And I don't really see that in their work because there's nobody who is well-intentioned when they set out to divide people. What these people are doing is nothing more than an appeal to be the authorities. They don't actually want to improve the situation for everyone. They want to improve it for themselves. And they know how to do it in this era. In a previous era, these same people might have dressed in a mitre, put on a cassock. They might have tried to be some guru in this day and age, they present themselves as knowing every answer to every problem on earth. I submit it's unlikely they've got all of those answers. And I encourage other people to be suspicious of them. What they've done is they've just taken key concepts of society that were neutral before and progressive, and they've just hijacked them. One of the biggest ideas that they've hijacked is the idea of social justice. You know, who doesn't want justice in society? Of course, we all want it. 
But their idea of social justice is to put us into these affinity groups, to separate people by their race, by their gender. It's to divide and conquer. And so that's not social justice. That becomes social injustice. If the banks and other financial institutions massively mismanage their only task, as they did in 2008, do not be distracted by them announcing an increase in diversity officers. If an energy company or a large corporation or a government department starts to talk about implicit bias, know that there are terrible things they are doing elsewhere that they hope to distract you from. Don't be distracted. If you're Coca-Cola, it's a lot easier to spout off about some voting law in Georgia that make you sound more like a super PAC than a soft drink manufacturer or to teach your employees how to be less white. It's a lot easier to do those things than it is to have an open conversation about your own product's impact on a nationwide epidemic of diabetes and obesity. By the way, in the very black community that they profess to care so much about. So same thing. I mean, you go down the consumer products list, Nike, okay? It's a lot easier to condemn slavery 250 years ago in the United States than it is to reduce your own reliance on slave labor today to get $250 sneakers that you sell to black kids in the inner city who can't afford to buy books for school. This is, a, it's a joke. It's a game these companies play in many cases to do what I call blow woke smoke to be able to deflect accountability and deflect the conversation away from the more controversial topics and more harmful topics to their business that they would rather not be talking about. So like I said, I think that's what's going on in about 75% of the cases. I think there are 25% of cases where you have authentic business leaders to say that, you know what, I only live once, I'm empowered in this seat of corporate power, and by hell or high water, I'm gonna use my power and my seat of authority to settle these questions in the way that I want to, because I couldn't necessarily win it in the political sphere through my vote, where I only get one vote. I couldn't necessarily win it through free speech and open debate, because my arguments may not have been persuasive to my fellow citizens. But now that I run a company and actually wield economic power, I'm gonna settle it through economic force instead. Most of us are sympathetic to the injustices we see in society and care deeply about the state of the world. And it's understandable that many consumers want big corporations to take on social responsibilities that they themselves feel powerless to address, like climate change. In fact, some people believe the situation in regards to the climate is so dire that it requires everyone from consumers to corporations to the government to make major changes. However, regardless of whether business leaders are sincere or cynical in their push for societal change, and even if we sometimes agree with their impulses, we should all be concerned with economic elites deciding that they can make important moral decisions for the rest of us. What if reimagining capitalism in this way actually destroys the system we all rely on? If you think your survival depends on lessening your carbon footprint, it depends even more on saving Western civilization. So whenever you see people knocking it, you gotta fight. You just got to. People have to stop thinking of capitalism as just a relationship of people and materials. It's a social, political state of liberty. It's a place wherein the individual is free to use his property as he sees fit, to think and act on his own judgment. That's why the more capitalistic or free a society, the greater a society thrives. And I think we have to start changing the messaging with capitalism so that people understand it's really about your liberty. It's really about human liberty. I think that people are more empowered than they think. At the end of the day, the best measure of the health of a democracy is the percentage of people who feel free to say what they actually think in public. And yes, we're doing pretty poorly, but you know what the good news is? There's a clear solution to that problem too. When you find yourself to be the only person in a room who believes what you do, my advice is you have a civic obligation today, now more than ever, you have a civic obligation to actually speak your mind. That doesn't mean be disrespectful when you do it, it means be respectful when you do it, but part of being respectful to the people around you is actually giving them the courtesy of actually knowing what you believe. And my commitment to you is that if you do it, my experience would suggest that you will discover that you weren't the only person in the room who actually believed what you did. And if you're fired for it, great. I have legal arguments I've laid out in my book and elsewhere that you can avail yourself of to say that actually the American legal system does a pretty darn good job of protecting you anyway. You're also more empowered by 
your own earnings and your own savings and your own investments. And what I predict we're gonna see in the next few years is the revival of a new economic movement in this country that says we actually need to put the unapologetic pursuit of excellence first again, that we as consumers don't want politics mixed with our businesses. Okay, we don't want to just go to Ben and Jerry's and order a cup of ice cream, but have to have their version of morality sprinkles doused on top. That's not what we want in this country. And I think over 100 million Americans are put off by that merger of progressive politics with big business that are gonna be able to vote not just every November, but vote every day with the places where they invest their dollars or spend their dollars to say that actually, I want a vision that goes back to separating politics from business. And as long as there are brave entrepreneurs who are willing to step up and capture that opportunity, I think that that's a way to use the market itself to bring our culture back. Not by doing it necessarily in the ways that I think some may be tempted to, offering a right-wing partisan alternative version. That, that's not what I'm into. But I do think by offering a version that's apolitical, that transcends partisan politics and goes back to putting excellence first in our culture and in our corporate culture, I think that's gonna be the defining market opportunity of the next decade. And that's another force that will use competitive market force to bring us back, to say that not that we're gonna have two parallel economies in the end, but that once you co-opt a million customers at a time from Nike or Airbnb or, or BlackRock for that matter, that those companies I predict five years from now will say that, you know what? Our approach to diversity and inclusion may not have been as diverse and inclusive as we thought it was, and we're gonna rethink our approach. That's what the positive path to winning our culture back looks like. That's what I'm focused on, and I hope that's what we're able to spawn as a new economic movement and cultural movement beyond our politics in our country today. That's where people are empowered. Hi everyone, thanks for watching. I hope you're enjoying my channel. Um, don't forget to subscribe, and if you'd like to see more of my work, you can head on over to Locals, which is an awesome free speech platform that won't take down or flag any videos, which YouTube is known to do. It's a great platform because people want to be there and they'll engage in meaningful dialogue with you, and it's awesome. Plus, if you sign up for a paid account, you can get access to content that is exclusive to Locals. You'll find a link for that in the description below. Also, if you ever see me lying down in interviews or in any of the videos, it's because I lived with debilitating back pain for years. So I just wanted to explain that so you understand what's going on. And uh, sometimes my little dog, Nora, might make an appearance. Nora, come here. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. All right. Thanks, everybody.